At some point, you have to believe something. We've reinvented computing as we know it. What is the vision for what you see coming next? We asked ourselves, if it can do this, how far can it go? How do we get from the robots that we have now to the future world that you see? Clear everything that moves will be robotic someday, and it will be soon. We invested tens of billions of dollars before it really happened. No, that's very good. You did some research. But the big breakthrough, I would say, uh, is when we... That's Jensen Wong. And whether you know it or not, his decisions are shaping your future. He's the CEO of NVIDIA, the company that skyrocketed over the past few years to become one of the most valuable companies in the world. Because they led a fundamental shift in how computers work, unleashing this current explosion of what's possible with technology. NVIDIA's done it again. We found ourselves being one of the most important technology companies in the world and potentially ever. A huge amount of the most futuristic tech that you're hearing about in AI and robotics and gaming and self-driving cars and breakthrough medical research relies on new chips and software designed by him and his company. During the dozens of background interviews that I did to prepare for this, what struck me most was how much Jensen Wong has already influenced all of our lives over the last 30 years, and how many said it's just the beginning of something even bigger. We all need to know what he's building and why, and most importantly, what he's trying to build next. Welcome to Huge Conversations. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so happy to do it. Before we dive in, I wanted to tell you how this interview is going to be a little bit different than other interviews I've seen okay. you do recently. Okay. I'm not going to ask you any questions about you could ask company me finances. You want. Thank you. I'm not going to ask you questions about your management style or why you don't like one-on-ones. I'm not going to ask you about regulations or politics. I think all of those things are important, but I think that our audience can get them well covered elsewhere. Okay. What we do on Huge If True is we make optimistic explainer videos mm -hmm. and we've covered... God, I'm, I'm the worst person to be an explainer video. I think you might be the best. And I think and that's what I'm really hoping that we can do together is yeah. make a joint explainer video about how can we actually use technology to make the future better. Yeah. And we do it because we believe that when people see those better futures, they help build them. So the people that you're going to be talking to are awesome. They are optimists who want to build those better futures. But because we cover so many different topics, we've covered supersonic planes and quantum computers and particle colliders. It means that millions of people come into every episode without any prior knowledge whatsoever. You might be talking to an expert in their field who doesn't know the difference between a CPU Big and trouble. a GPU. Yeah. Yeah. Or a 12-year-old who might grow up one day to be you, but is just starting to learn. Um, for my part, I've now been preparing for this interview for several months. I've including doing background conversations with many members of your team, but I'm not an engineer. So my goal is to help that audience see the future that you see. So I'm gonna ask about three areas. The first is, how did we get here? What were the key insights that led to this big fundamental shift in computing that we're in now? The second is, what's actually happening right now? Well, how did those insights lead to the world that we're now living in that seems like so much is going on all at once? And the third is, what is the vision for what you see coming next? In order to talk about this big moment we're in with AI, I think we need to go back to video games in the 90s. At the time, I know game developers wanted to create more realistic looking graphics, but the hardware couldn't keep up with all of that necessary math. Not enough math. NVIDIA came up with a solution that would change not just games, but computing itself. Could you take us back there and explain what was happening and what were the insights that led you and the NVIDIA team to create the first modern GPU? So in the early 90s, when we first started the company, we observed that in a software program, inside it, there are just a few lines of code, maybe 10% of the code does 99% of the processing. And that 99% of the processing could be done in parallel. However, the other 90% of the code has to be done sequentially. It turns out that the proper computer, the perfect computer, is one that could do sequential processing and parallel processing, not just one or the other. That was the big observation. And we set out to build a company to solve computer problems that normal computers can't. And that's really the beginning of NVIDIA. 
My favorite visual of why a CPU versus a GPU really matters so much is a 15-year-old video on the NVIDIA YouTube channel, where the Mythbusters, they use a little robot shooting paintballs one by one to show solving problems one at a time or sequential processing on a CPU. But then they roll out this huge robot that shoots all of the paintballs at once, doing smaller problems all at the same time, or parallel processing on a GPU. Three, two, one. So NVIDIA unlocks all of this new power for video games. Why gaming first? The video games uh, requires parallel processing for uh, processing 3D graphics. And we chose video games because one, we loved the application. It's a simulation of virtual worlds and who doesn't want to go to virtual worlds. And, and we had the good observation that video games has potential to be the largest market for, for entertainment ever. And it turned out to be true. And having it being a large market is important because the technology is complicated. And if we had a large market, our R&D budget could be large, we could create new technology. And that flywheel between technology and market and greater technology was, was really the flywheel that got NVIDIA to become one of the most important technology companies in the world. And it was all because of video games. I've heard you say that GPUs were a time machine. Yeah. Could you tell me more about what you meant by that? A GPU is like a time machine because it lets you see the future sooner. One of the most amazing things uh, anybody's ever said to me was a uh, quantum chemistry scientist. He said, Jensen, because of NVIDIA's work, I can do my life's work in my lifetime. That's time travel. He was able to do something that was beyond his lifetime, uh, within his lifetime. And, and that's because we make applications run so much faster. And so you get to see the future. And so when you're doing weather prediction, for example, you're seeing the future. When you're doing a, a simulation, a virtual city with virtual traffic, and we're um, simulating our self-driving car through that virtual city, we're doing time travel. So parallel processing takes off in mm -hmm. gaming. And it's allowing us to create worlds in computers that we never could have before. And, and gaming is sort of this, this first incredible case of parallel processing unlocking a mm -hmm. lot more power. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, people begin to use that power across many different industries. Mm -hmm. The case of the, of the quantum chemistry researcher. Mm -hmm. When I've heard you tell that story, it's that he was running molecular simulations mm -hmm. in a way where it was much faster to run in parallel on mm -hmm. NVIDIA GPUs mm -hmm. even then than it was to run them on the supercomputer with the CPU that he had been using before. Yeah, that's true. So, oh my God, it's revolutionizing all of these other industries as well. Mm -hmm. It's beginning to change how we see what's possible with computers. And my understanding is that in the early 2000s, you see this and you realize that Actually doing that is a little bit difficult because what that researcher had to do is he had to sort of trick the GPUs into thinking that his problem was a graphics problem. That's exactly right. No, that's very good. Well, so you, you create... You did some research. So you create a way to make that a lot easier. That's right. Specifically, it's a platform called CUDA, which lets programmers tell the GPU what to do using programming languages that they already know, like C. And that's a big deal because it gives way more people easier access to all of this computing power. Could you explain what the vision was that led you to create CUDA? Partly uh, researchers uh, discovering it, partly internal uh, inspiration, and um, uh, and partly solving a problem. And you know, a lot of interesting interesting ideas come out of that soup. You know, some of it is is uh, aspiration and inspiration. Some of it is just desperation. You know, and and so in in the case of CUDA, it was very much this the same way. And um, probably the first external ideas of using our GPUs for parallel processing emerged out of some interesting work in uh, medical imaging. A couple of researchers at Mass General were using it uh, to do uh, CT reconstruction. Hmm. They were using our graphics processors for that reason, and it inspired us. Meanwhile, the problem that we're trying to solve inside our company has to do with the fact that when you're trying to create these virtual worlds for video games, you would like it to be beautiful, but also dynamic. Water should flow like water and explosions should be like explosions. So there's particle physics you want to do, fluid dynamics you want to do. And uh, that is much harder to do if your pipeline is only able to do computer graphics. 
And so we have a natural reason to want to do it in, in the, the, the market that we were serving. So researchers were also um, horsing around with using our GPUs for general purpose uh, acceleration. And, and so there were, there were multiple, multiple factors that were coming together in that soup. Uh, we just, when the time came, and uh, uh, we decided to, to uh, do something proper and create a CUDA as a result of that. Fundamentally, the reason why, why I was certain that CUDA was going to be successful and we, we uh, put the whole company behind it was because fundamentally, uh, our GPU was going to be the highest volume parallel processors built in the world because the market of video games was so large. And so this architecture has a good chance of reaching many people. It has seemed to me like creating CUDA was this incredibly optimistic, huge if true thing to do, where you were saying, if we create a way for many more people to use much more computing power, they might create incredible things. Mm. And then, of course, it came true. They did. In 2012, a group of three researchers submits an entry to a famous competition, where the goal is to create computer systems that could recognize images and label them with categories. And their entry just crushes the competition. It gets way fewer answers wrong. It was incredible. And it blows everyone away. It's called AlexNet, and it's a kind of AI called a neural network. My understanding is one reason it was so good is that they used a huge amount of data to train that system. And they did it on NVIDIA GPUs. All of a sudden, GPUs weren't just a way to make computers faster and more efficient. They're becoming the engines of a whole new way of computing. We're moving from instructing computers with step-by-step -step directions to training computers to learn by showing them a huge number of examples. This moment in 2012 really kicked off this truly seismic shift that we're all seeing with AI right now. Could you describe what that moment was like from your perspective? Mm. And what did you see it would mean for all of our futures. When you create something new like CUDA, if you build it, they might not come. And, and that's, that's always the, the cynic's perspective. However, the optimist perspective would say, but if you don't build it, they can't come. And that's usually how we look at the world. You know, we, we have to reason about intuitively why this would be very useful. And in fact, uh, in 2012, Ilya Suskover and Alex Krzyzewski and Jeff Hinton in the uh, University of Toronto, the lab that they were at, they reached out to a GeForce GTX 580 because they learned about CUDA and that CUDA might be able to, to be used as a parallel processor for training AlexNet. And uh, so our inspiration that GeForce could be the, the vehicle to bring out this parallel architecture into the world and that researchers would somehow find it someday was a good was a good strategy. It was a strategy based on hope, um, but it was also reasoned hope. The, the thing that really caught our attention was simultaneously we were trying to solve the computer vision problem inside the company, and we were trying to get CUDA to uh, be a good computer vision uh, processor. And we were frustrated by by a, a whole bunch of early developments internally with respect to our our um, uh, computer vision effort and getting CUDA to be able to do it. And all of a sudden, we saw AlexNet, um, this new algorithm uh, that that is uh, completely different co than computer vision algorithms before it, uh, take a giant leap in terms of capability for computer vision. And when we saw that, it was partly out of interest, but partly because we were st struggling with something ourselves. And so we were, we were highly interested to want to see it work. And so when we, re when we looked at AlexNet, we were inspired by that. Um, but the big breakthrough, I would say, uh, is when we, when we saw AlexNet, we asked ourselves, you know, how far can AlexNet go? If it can do this with computer vision, how far can it go? And if it, if it could go to the limits of what we think it could go, um, the type of problems it could solve, what would it mean for the computer industry and what would it mean for the computer architecture? And we were, we were, um, uh, we rightfully reasoned that if machine learning, if these deep learning architecture can scale, uh, the vast majority of machine learning problems could be represented with deep neural networks. And the type of problems we could solve with machine learning is so vast that it has the potential of reshaping the computer industry altogether. And which prompted us to uh, re-engineer the entire computing stack, which is where uh, DGX came from and this little baby DGX sitting here. Um, uh, uh, all of this came from, from that observation that we ought to reinvent the entire computing stack layer by layer by layer. 
you know, computers after 65 years since uh, IBM System 360 introduced modern general purpose computing. We've reinvented computing as we know it. So think about this as a whole story. So parallel processing reinvents modern gaming Mm -hmm. and revolutionizes an entire industry. Then that way of computing, that parallel processing, begins to be used across different industries. You invest in that by building CUDA. And then CUDA and the use of GPUs allows for a, a step change in neural networks and machine learning and begins a sort of revolution that we're now seeing uh, only increase in importance today. 